right. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning on this rainy, hot good morning. It's disgusting as I can't do it. Why we're we'll, uh, <laughs> doing all that. Hey, you got to be sure to check in, let us know where you're coming in from. We'd like to you know, greet you with a little bit of lore, tell you where you're from, so we can say hi to you. Facebook family, YouTube family, check in, check in. And um, it's how you been, Jill. It's my oh, first time actually doing this with you. I, I, know. Do with this Victoria. I know. I'm usually so, with Kevin, and he's out of town. He's doing his. He's uh, doing doctoral things. Yes, Go ahead he and do the mic that you yes, watched. You that. Are, so yes. we'll applause right now on that, all right? So, uh, yeah. So, uh, really, so let me ask you something, Jill. Yes. Before we get, as we get started, what did you think about last week's message? Okay, first of all, I was re watching it yesterday and this morning. Okay. And when uh, Dr. Price said God discovered himself, I was going to ask back in the See, see, only, only, only she can say some stuff like that. I was sharing with somebody, really, even Dr. Price. You know, I was saying, I said, I'm 37 years old, and I was today's years old. I was last week. That's the first time I actually heard the creation story in that manner. So I thought it was absolutely wonderful. So, so if you guys have not heard last week's message, please go back and listen to that. But also tune in for this message too, because I'm sure it's going to blow you away. Yes. So we got some announcements we didn't talk about. Are y'all checking in yet? I don't see no names. Where y'all at? Come on, where y'all? Okay, okay, there we are. Hi, how you doing, Miss Francine? How you doing? Hey, it's Cassandra, how you, how you hey, doing? How are you guys doing? Well, what's the YouTube family looking like? Anybody right say anything? Okay, all right. Yeah, y'all be kind of shy today. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, so you know, so tell the folks how they kind of connect with us. Well, well we now have these congregation of the mighty cards that you can connect to uh, Dr. Price, and if you scan this, it also gives you a way to give as well. We fancy. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so uh, also, y'all, my favorite thing to talk about. The summit. We got the summit coming up. So you guys weren't here in June. You got a chance to make it up in November, all right? So it's a save the day, the near apostolic summit. It is going so right now. I need you guys to take off now. No excuses. Put your money aside for the tickets. We need you to be here on this high mountain, all right? going to be November 16th through the 19th, okay, here at the embassy. We want you guys to be here because, you know, a lot of things are changing in the world, so you really want to know what God's high officials are saying, what the next move are, and really what your orders are, because you, you just don't want to come to something all good and fuzzy wuzzy inside, and then you don't know what to do. So, exactly. we want you to be here. If you register at paulaprice.com, get your tickets. Uh, hotels that are around, so make sure you be there, okay? And, we want to see your faces. And right now, if you register, there is the buy one, get one free going. So, uh, okay, right now so is the best time to do it because you and your spouse, or you and your family, or whoever can show up and do buy one, get one free for the ticket. Yeah, well, inflation at 9.1%. Yes, you want to save it's some the money. best time to do it. <laughs> All right, so now, <laughs> so don't forget, we're going to hammer this home. We do it in my drills. All right, listen, if, I, if I, how old is Cody? He is eight years old. This boy put us to shame. So we need y'all to get these drills, do these drills with us. And really, you want this thing to really cellulate on the inside of it. And really, and not just repeat them, really understand what these drills are all about. You want to understand your identity, because identity is the key to destiny, all right? And one last thing. We have our uh, biotic puzzle. This puzzle. is the last day of the uh, Faith and Family Month, but that is does not mean that you don't have time to spend time with your family and do some fun things. So we have our biotic puzzle that can help you with um, cellulating this in your family. So, so yeah, so th there's that. So, we, <laughs> <laughs> so you guys stay put. We, we always enjoy talking to you guys. Stay put and we'll, we'll see you soon. All right. Bye guys. Take care.
Good morning, congregation of the mighty. I am here before you this morning uh, just to give you this prophetic word. We want to just go ahead and, and, and wrap this up of God's civic duty to the kingdom and, and what that is, again, what that entails. We talked about uh, civic duty as well as civic responsibility and what that meant, uh, as well as uh, being fit for duty and why that is so important and, and the meaning of, of being physically and mentally in emotional state of being able to perform uh, the essential duties and responsibilities of our assignment and again we discussed you know why that is so important and two we talked about uh well, there's just, I'll move this down here for a second. Uh, conduct unbecoming of an officer and what that means and what that means for an officer and what that means as just an employee or someone as part of the kingdom. And, you know, just to bring this all together of, of why God is talking about this and why God, this is so important that the Holy Spirit is bringing this up. And it really is. You know, God is bringing us to a point uh, of crafting us as, as his embassy and as his consulate and see the, the sovereignty uh, as well as function needs to be replaced uh, and brought back into the congregation of God's churches and of God's body and see the congregation of the mighty is going to be one of those examples that so many in the body of Christ are going to look to for, for wisdom, for intelligence, for the pattern of which to do this. So I want you to stop and think about that. You are going to be the pattern. You are going to be the standard bearer. You are going to be that example that so many in the body of Christ will look to. But to be the standard, we have to uphold the standard. And so God is shifting us uh, as his dunamites, as the congregation of the mighty, not to simply just be believers, not to simply just be those that are partakers but to be doers of the word and what exactly that means. And God is calling us to that higher place and purpose as his consulate, as his embassy. And I want you to start opening up your thoughts and your minds and your hearts to him. I want you to begin, uh, even this next season, to begin to pray. Pray and ask God, what part of the embassy is he calling you to partake of? What comfort zone is he requiring you to push beyond to be fit for duty? Uh, what misconduct or even hidden despites for the things of God are do you need to deal with? Do you need to confront? Do you have to have that your soul rewritten for uh, so that God can use you under the pressure uh, of being that standard bearer. You know, guys, it's not just going to be us. It's not just going to be Dr. Price. It's not going to be just the leaders. It's going to be you. People's eyes, leaders' eyes, are going to be on those in the background, quote unquote, that uh, those background conversations. Guys, you're going to be, you're going to be heard. You're going to be seen. You're going to be scrutinized. Why? Not because people are trying to pick you apart, but they're trying to see what works and what doesn't. And see, we have been raised for such a time as, as this to show the body of Christ how it works, how it's supposed to work, and how we are supposed to be the standard bearers against pushing it against the darkness as well as being the city on the hill, as well as being that example in the body of Christ of how to be his embassy, how to be his standard bearer, and how to be that light, how to be that stronghold. But first we have to be strong and we have to do the work of being strong. So I wanna encourage you in this season, 
as we continue on, do what it takes to be fit for duty. Make sure that you are fulfilling your civic duty and your civic responsibility to the kingdom, just between even you and God, to yourself and to the kingdom that God has called you to, and making sure there's no conduct even in your soul, in your way of thinking, in your and the meditations of your heart that would be unfit for duty. Congregation of the Mighty, I love you. It is time for the faithful to arise. Welcome to the Congregation of the Mighty Ecclesial Embassy, where God stands. Our Chief Apostle is Dr. Paula Price. Join us every Sunday at 8 a.m. for Sunday School, 10 a.m. for our main worship service, and Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. for midweek adult and youth group service. Staying connected at the Congregation of the Mighty is easy. Sign up for our small group weekly tele-discussion calls, a Sunday school class, or a prayer cohort call at www.congregationofthemighty.com or stop by the Welcome Alcove. Don't forget to stop by the Embassy Cafe before and after service for food and fellowship. Well, the first thing, my first part of the answer is that I don't approach it as a pastor who is obligated to the peace and comfort of a congregation. I represent the Godhead. I'm very clear on that. And, and it has made itself or the Lord has made himself very, very present to me. I've had enormous encounters with God to gain his heart. When you are representing someone, your thoughts ought not to matter. Your opinions, even your fears ought not to matter. So he tells me what he thinks, you know, and I, re I read my Bible and I look in the fact, like, for example, let's just take the question of people saying, well, the Bible's dated. I love that, you know, and I said, dated how? Because I'm reading the Bible and it's reading like your news. It's doing the same thing. It's reading like these, the, the YouTubes and the, the, uh, media postings so we did not you know to this modern society did not invent fornication and and so many christians are buying into that as if this generation invented sin and they didn't i mean god has been dealing with this since the foundation of the world so what people are not expecting from me is that number one i'm intelligent I'm intelligent because God made me that way. The man gave me a brand new brain because remember I told you I was a lady that couldn't write the proposals. So that's number one. Number two, I'm studied and I'm learning. And number three, my particular commodity, ministerial commodity is wisdom. I connect the dots and I fill in the blanks. And that's what you don't get. Instead, pastors, because of conditioning or because of political correctness, they feel as if they have to make people feel good, even if people are abusing God. And I don't feel good about abusing God. And in this subject, I get very animated because I'm telling you that the things that we do to God in Christ, we would not do to our friend and half of our enemies would never know it. We'd shut our mouths and walk away. So I take care of it. Like I talk about abortion. I talk about homosexuality. I talk about, you know, adultery and the swingers clubs and all of that. And I talk about it, not just from a biblical standpoint. I talk about it from the point of science. I talk about it from the point of humanity. I talk about it from the point of sociology, psychology, neuro theology, neuropsychology. So I can, can come at those issues from so many different ways that people are like, wow. And they don't feel like they've been rammed in the face with the Bible. Now I use scripture all the time because you know, Jesus is my honey. I'm going to use some scripture. And so I use scripture, but I use the wisdom of God. You know, we've had the word, we've had the works, but we've not had the wisdom. So when I address it, especially on my show, taking it on with Paula Price, yes, I do. It's name taking it on because I plan to take it on. And I spent 30 years in the Lord's laboratory being groomed for this very hour and time in history. And I thank him for the opportunity to address these things for you. Subscribe to Dr. Price's Taking It On podcast by visiting www.drpaulaaprice.com. Scroll down to podcast and click on listen, subscribe and download.
subscribe, begin listening, and download your podcasts today. You can also subscribe from iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. up a generation of children who are learning what it means to be born of God and a mighty one for the Lord Jesus Christ. They may be tiny, but they are mighty. guys doing fantastic yes okay are we ready for our decree one more time are we ready for our decree all right there you are okay ready we are new era apostleship restitution where we disciple apostolic christians into becoming scripturally organic culturally unmodified christians at the congregation of the mighty where god sends Woo! hallelujah all right guys it's time to sow come on and give god praise for the ability to give into the vision and the mission of this house and to accomplish what God wants to accomplish financially. Amen. Ways to give. You can make your checks payable to C-O-M-E-E. Also, you can do text to give as well as PayPal. And you can also click give on the church app. Please, please, if you're filling out an envelope, which everybody should be, um, make it legible. Fill it out completely. And parents, don't forget, that in children's church, we also do offering. Our kids don't have jobs, so we have to kind of provide for them a little bit. Okay, so just remember that we want to teach our children how to give as well and to give faithfully. Faithfully. Err Sunday. Everybody say err Sunday. Okay, amen. <laughs> Hello, I'm Guy Donahue, and this is my wife, Charlotte Donahue. Uh, we've been married nine and a half glorious years, and we've known Dr. Price two years, maybe a little over, and uh, have become very friendly with her and uh, have watched her grow and grow her ministry. So it's been a, a wonderful trip. She amazes us. She and I have had a lot of discussions. Now, I'm, I'm a purveyor of truth of the Bible. And uh, we read, ever since we've been married, we've read through the Bible every year. We read it out loud. One morning I read her 
read to her and the next morning she reads to me. But I've done that for years beforehand and, and have taught for many years. But she amazes me how in depth she goes with the scriptures. And I have questions that I go to her and uh, ask her because I want to hear her viewpoint. I have never asked her a question that she hasn't studied and came up with a very biblical answer. She's very unique. She's very wise. I had a spiritual issue that she helped me with and it was amazing and I will remember her for that. And I just like her personally. I could almost sit at her feet and listen to her for hours. She's an amazing woman. I don't know anybody that has the study that I am seeing her put forth. She has spent hours digging into the Word and you know, the, the, the Bible is multi-layered and she's got into layers that a lot of people are totally unfamiliar with. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that she has a real passion for preparing the church for the last days. Mm -hmm. And I believe that her goal is to equip people to hear what God's saying to them about their life. And she likes she likes to give you information. Dr. Price delights in poking you, see where you're at, and really get you to affirm what you believe and maybe need to study what you don't believe. I had my 16-year-old granddaughter there that night, and she had never been to uh, any thing and I thought she it would be a a good exposure to be with Dr. Price and they seated her away from us and uh, afterwards I asked her what did you think about it she said I really felt the energy of the group and I really enjoyed what she's saying because she makes you think we found out later on that she was an avowed atheist. Now we're happy to say that she received the Lord in our prayer group about a month ago, all by herself.
to the almighty God. Glory. Hallelujah, Lord, we lift you up and we bless you today. We say thank you, Jesus, for your provision. Thank you, Jesus, for all the ways that you've made out of no way. Ah, thank you, King Jesus. God, we glorify you. We praise you for this offering. We thank you for every seed, Lord God, that has been sown today. And we thank you, King Jesus, for all the things that will flourish from it. We give you praise, God, that we're able to give into great ground, prosperous ground, hallelujah, functioning ground. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I could sing that song every week in praise and worship. So if you hear it every week in praise and worship for a while, just understand, I need it. <laughs> it's a great song. Two quick announcements. One, in uh, August, which next week, begin children, you are dismissed, yes, uh, which begins next week, August and September, after prayer, post-service. Hey! Oh, so much red. So much red. She's stepping heavy. She's stepping heavy. Hey, they do this now. I do not have to cue anybody. Because we love you! Told you, you will always be honored in your own house. At least at your own services here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Back to today. Yesterday's gone. Today is today. Two very quick things. The end of service, we have post-service prayer uh, most Sundays, in, I mean, while they're here or in the chapel. And so August, we're resuming our standard midweek everything flow as far as tele-discussion calls will resume. Did you have fun in your July playtime? Yes. Wonderful. Well, it's time to get back to it. So we don't want to hear about I forgot and I thought and I didn't know and so the prayer pod calls resuming, the tele-discussion group calls resuming, uh, post-service prayer. Our post-service prayer emphasis the next couple of months will be deliverance. Because, guys, we got to have devils be gone about it here, okay? And so devils be gone. I was talking to Rachel last night. I said devils are going out of the people. And, you know, we the leader's running through too. And so um, after service... The apostles, prophets, uh, and minist training, ministers in training, the prophets and apostles in training will be praying for you all first, third, and fourth Sunday in here. We won't be in there because we'll need all this space in here uh, for specifically deliverance. Now, if you have a prayer that is not of that nature, you can still come down and get prayer. We will pray for you. But that is our goal and emphasis. Dr. Price is stirring it up with the 3D. And so since she's stirring it up, we need to cast it out. Because there's a time to just stop talking and just start casting out, not simulcasting somewhere else. And so casting those out. So if you want deliverance, if you want to be free, take that time to prep, pray, extra time with the Lord, extra time in your word to make sure you're going after the right thing. You might need to come down here all six times that we're doing this. Come on down. Get them all out. All right. And then the other announcement I want to make is Dr. Price received a fantastic invitation. We got in the email from Or Roberts University's Holy Spirit Research Center <laughs> to be added. <laughs> hmm? Oh, a lot of people know that. And they know that. Holy Spirit Research Center. She got an email. We're going to find out how they found out about her. Um, the gentleman over it said that Basically, I just found out that you're in Tulsa and who you are and that you are, these are my words, okay, in authority on the prophetic and want to include your materials in our Holy Spirit Resource Center at Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where you live. No longer a prophet without honor, even though you're an apostle in your own town. And so, uh, and, and they want to know and have anything that she has produced and published, particularly in that area. Now they're going to meet her. They're going to find out about the apostle. We already know how this is going to go, but we'll start with the prophet because God starts everything with the prophet and clearly the prophet's dictionary and handbook and 
Oh, constructing a contemporary prophet. Yes, they don't, they don't know anything about that, though. However, yeah, that's Prophet Marie's favorite training manual. She eats that thing up. And so congratulations to our chief apostle. Come on, stand up. Come on, let's just stand up. This is a huge deal. If you don't know, now you know it's a really big deal. And we congratulate you on such a prestigious invitation into the Oral Roberts University Holy Spirit Research Center. I just like saying it. And now it is your turn. Yes. Woo. Mr. Red Shoe, I don't know, hang on. I'm stepping to death. You all may be seated. Thank you so much. Um, what I wrote, Constructing a Contemporary Prophet in 1993. And of, of all the pe people, who, how many of you all heard of that were back there with me? I only had a handful of folk, but remember, you remember Constructing. And it really, it took the prophetic by the storm. And it did it because, can we thank God for our dancers? Did they show off this? We love you. Thank you. They showed off yesterday, you know that? And uh, and then, um, was it Senator Jett? Is that who was? Yeah, Senator Jett. Senator Jett was saying, yeah, he, he really enjoyed that. You know, sometimes we enjoy it, but it's nice to know that they can touch the body as with first fruits of praise. But in 1993, I completed a book. It was my first book. I had never, no, I had written a little, that little pamphlet, those of you who are in the class, um, Salvation, the Powers That Make the Difference. Yes. 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 Yeah, that was, a, that's one of y'all textbooks, isn't it? Yes. Right. And so I've written that, and I was so excited to write that because I needed to sleep for like six months. <laughs> but when God baptized me in the Holy Spirit, he immediately started talking. Now, I'm a Baptist God, girl, so I don't know God talks. Every, I, you know, most of us, you know, unless you're in that whole word of faith, charismatic, you don't know God has a voice. You know, he has a word. And so he started talking to me. And he began to talk to me like we were in, we were sitting over breakfast or in the, in the living room or something. And he started talking to me. Now, I don't know it's prophets because, you know, again, I'm Baptist. I don't know about a prophet. And so, um, and, and, and those we did know, how many of us always say they were all dead, right? Because they taught them as if they were dead and that God stopped doing that. So as he began to talk with me, he began to use my career and my education. And so I, at the time, was employed by the Bell System. I was a major account executive and had to do all of the things for these large accounts that I had, you know, Wall Street and, and insurance and attorneys and all of that. So he began to talk to me. Well, what I had to do is you had to make a sale. So from, from hello to installed to trained to uh, supervised. So that was pretty much those four spots. And so I thought, oh, well, I could do this. Jesus, God, I know this. So I started thinking we could just go and plug in the Bible. So I did. And every scripture in the Bible, he tied to my career and my experience. And so I said, well, I can, you know, do that. So I said, but I want to know about the prophet thing, because you are not a, I don't care about these kids that's getting on the mic. You are not a prophet if God didn't train you through the prophets. Every prophet, every, now you could be a gift, but you cannot be an official prophet if Jeremiah didn't train you. You can't be an official prophet if Ezekiel did not talk to you. You cannot be an official prophet if Malachi didn't instruct you. You can't be an official prophet if Isaiah didn't introduce you to the office. You cannot be a prophet if you don't know Moses who started it all. You can't be a prophet if you think it started with the law. I'm telling you right now, because see, y'all need to vet these kids. Because when God first talks to a prophet, he only talks his word. Now, you don't even realize how smart he is. So I, for the first six months, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, for the first six months, I could only study the scriptures. How are you going to say you're the voice of somebody you never learned? 
See, that sounds stupid to you. That's like saying the lawyer's talking about, I never heard of a constitution. So he started the first six months, it was his word. Now he spoke to me the first day he baptized me in the Holy Ghost. Now let me just tell those of you who think he only waits till you get saved. God, God spoke to me when I was six. Six years old, a man was trying to kidnap me. And I was walking on the edge of a hill and he, he was an old guy and he was, he was shuffling like this and he kept reaching for my leg. And God spoke to me and said, run and run fast. I, I could not tell you at six that it was God, but I can tell you that the voice told me to run. And that's the first time I heard God speak to me. The second time I heard God speak to me audibly is when he told me, don't marry my first husband. So y'all don't have to be saved for God to warn you. I wish I could tell you I listened. But I didn't. I was, you know, you know, I got her because, you know, my mother already, they put out all of this money for the hall and all of this. I got my dress, so I got to marry her, which was horrible. So those were the times. The next time God talked to me was when he told me that I was going to be saved. And I said, I go to church, I'm saved. Silence. Y'all ever know when God follows up your answer with silence, that answer is probably wrong. <laughs> so I said, I, I go to church, I'm saved. Silence. So then I went to this um, revival and because God was training me to do what I am doing, which is more kingdom than congregational church, the man preached a service called, Are You Effective in Life? He said, I know you're busy. I know you are involved. But are you effective? Meaning, are the results you're getting worth your life and your effort? Now, you know, that was... 1982, I still remember. Well, at that time, you know, I was in business and, and all your meetings were effective and are you getting results and all of that, so I was there. Now, I was convinced I was saved, so he asked me to come down and get more effective. So I came down in my designer suit, my overpriced shoes, my precision hairdo, because you didn't work in that and not be that then. And I walked on down there to become effective. So they started praying and a man came to me and he said, I'm gonna lay hands on you and he's gonna lay hands on me and I'm gonna receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Don't know what it is, but if it's gonna bring effective, make me have more sales, I'm gonna get more money, I am good with that. That man laid hands on me, looked in my eyes and shouted in my face, and I went. And I began, my back began to click, because see, I was in there cold. And I'm my back, and I can hear my spine going click, click, click. So they finally laid me down. Long story short, a good amount of spiritual warfare, like when she's talking about deliverance, you don't know how much all that stuff you played with is still there. And it's influencing and hindering all of those astrology checks that you did. You may not have been in hard witchcraft, but you went into new age thoughts and ideologies. All of those things that you touch while you were exploring who and what religion you're going to follow. So I was in all of that because I wanted to be powerful. I wanted to have a lot of money because that was that world. And so I did. I can't tell you how many demons were there helping me succeed. They were like the, the background, the back office of my soul. And they were making me successful. So he began to call this and that. Now, just as a back step, in 1972, I got a, an invitation to get my, uh, to, to have my sign read. 
and I paid the money. At that time, I was losing everything, the whole bit. So I paid the money to find out who I am. Because remember, I don't know that God knows. I'm convinced God has no idea who I am. So they sent me back a package of almost 20 pages of me. And they nailed me to a T. I know. I walked around. Some of you all still probably still have yours packed away. I walked around with that because it was the first time in my life I was identified and I was defined. Now, I'd always been successful because if I set out to do something, I'm going to do it. And so it was the first time in my life that somebody nailed me. Now, considering my background, many of you have not purchased my book, Assessing Your Prophetic Self. This is in it. Chapter 2. You need to read chapter 2 because it defines all of this. And if you get it today, I'm going to give you a 5% discount. We're going to call it the author's discount. Today. That means when we look at the clock. See. <laughs> See, I know the saints. When the clock strikes midnight, it goes away. So, now she may package it in something else, but read chapter two and it tells you how I became what I'm doing. So, this, this, this piece of paper became my Bible because it defined me. I'm going somewhere. So I get saved, but I got the paper. Now I'm deep in astrology. I never knew what was wrong with that, but I could tell people from afar who they were. That's how sophisticated my devils were. I get saved. That night, all them devils come to visit. See, y'all think because you get saved and go your way, you're all right. Devils hit back smack back and come back. They have a comeback plan. And so they fought me for a good year. But again, if I make up my mind, I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And so I read that Bible day and night, night and day, day and night, night and day. <clears throat> I read it up to 22 hours a day. I ate it. I took it everywhere. And at that time, <coughs> you didn't have it. No, we didn't have Google. I carried it everywhere because the man said one thing. <coughs> he said, if you don't fill that space with the word, they're coming back. And so the first thing God did is takes me to the scripture that says, when an unclean spirit is cast out of a man, he goes and what? He goes to dry places. But eventually he wants to see if the apartment is leased. <laughs> and so when he comes back and see the vacancy sign is still there, says something very powerful. That's why some of you all are having a hard time getting delivered. He said, he comes back bringing seven more spirits, let's understand it, worse than himself. Now, you were already struggling with the one that the Lord cast out. The seven more is like a death sentence. So, what does the enemy do? Is he tell you, A, you don't need the word because they're always looking for a new home. They want to trade up from the apartment, the efficiency, to the condo, to the palace. So that, because my deliverance was so agonizing, it was, I mean, I didn't even know anything. You don't even know your spirit has feelings until God starts delivering it. So he did not just deliver me. And I can speak this now, years later. This was 1982. It was October 1982. You can see how impactful it was. But he took 
and he had something like a uh, like a laser, and he cut a hole in my soul, and it burned for months, and it burned, and the only thing that stopped the burning was reading the word, and. It was so bad that it, 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 every time a voice yelled, it would quiver. And he made me go through it. Well, the first night I saw this spirit look like an ape. And I was sitting there praying in tongues and my eyes were open. And my, this, this wall slid away and this ape came out and he had on a white playful t-shirt. The next time, others started showing up. I said, but who are these people? He said, they were in you. So who wants seven more apes? He said, that is why I told you to read the word. And so I did, and eventually, it took about six months before that agony of my spirit, the what he packed, because there was a grafting. He re literally grafted a new spirit and the elements of a new soul in me and so because the spirit is new so it had to be my soul and so we with that I mean I read it I read it I read it after I said listen God these things won't stop they would wake me up in the morning and my my knowledge of the word would, would come at them that's why I know the word is right my and, and they would wake me up one woke me up and he said I'm Jesus with dreadlocks. Now, I'm not real smart, but I kind of think Jesus does not have dreadlocks. Okay? I mean, a name, dread. That's already scary. How are you going to be like? And I said, I rolled over from my sleep. I said, Jews are lie. And when I said it, he left and went through my window and walked and so they would, I was doing spiritual warfare, but how many of you know that's fatiguing? So I asked God to do me a favor because I'd open up a lot of doors. And I asked God to do me a favor. I said, would you do me a favor and shut this down? And he did. And he did for nearly 12 years. In his place, though, I got baptized with miracles. And because I filled myself with the word, I could see them. They knew I could see them, but I finally grew in power over that. I remember doing a service one night, and a deaf woman came up with two hearing aids. And she's a, she's a young woman, and she's small, and she came, and she kept saying, Doc, well, at that time, I think it was Pastor Price, Pastor Price, Pastor Price, Pastor Price. And I'm thinking, who is this? And I looked down and I said, yes. And she says, what do you want? She said, I want to hear. See, if you get out the word, you lose courage. Because the power that's working in you is not being regenerated. So it actually cuts off your generator. So I said, okay. So I touch her, her ears and I said, now take out your hearing aids. And I touched her ears, and the Holy Ghost almost lifted her off the floor by her head. And she went, I'm like, but, but at that time, I did enormous miracles. I did them all, a lot of them. And so she began to hear. And I talked to her, and she talked to me. I said, well, tell me what you're hearing. And she told me what she was hearing. And so, because I wanted to know, are you hearing or are you reading lips? So I made her, you know, turn around. So she heard, but here's what happened to her healing. Do you want to know? Yes. Her pastors told her it wasn't going to last. Now, I'm new, so I don't know that pastors do this to keep their egos intact. So when I see her six months later, she's back with the hearing aids. And she told me what happened. Now, think about all of the miracles Jesus did and how many of them look like they didn't work or didn't last. Because it's in that moment, it's whoever snatches your faith in the second that that miracle happened is the one who decides whether it lasts. Jesus did not want Mary to miscarriage him. 
So he sent her away from all of the people who could verbally abort that kid. Sometimes when you get your miracle, you need to go away from everybody who would like to talk you out of it and take it from you. I can tell you again and again and again what happens to miracles when you have to go back home. We need to probably have a, a miracle rehab center. I did, a, I have done so many miracles here in Tulsa when I was here with Pam Vanette's conference. I remember a man came in a wheelchair and I prayed for him and the pastor came over and told him if it doesn't work, it'll be okay. I went behind the pastor and said, if it doesn't work, it's because you don't want it. When I came back a year or so later, he was in the choir. We did the miracle. Many of you all remember the miracle that we did with your sister. Do you remember? So miracles come with the territory, but they will not operate on demand without you having the text and the power of the text to work them. I'm, uh, the emotional miracles, I mean, I'm like nonstop with that. You know, soul healing, that's it. So when I did all of this, it came from that book because I tried to find books on the prophetic that, was, that were lining up with how God was grooming me and I found none. I moved all over the world. I went to Singapore. I went to uh, Britain. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I went to islands. There were, and I would go to everywhere I went, I'd go to a library or a bookstore hoping to get a text that articulated what the Lord was saying to me. And I found none. All of the text was focusing on the gift and God was talking to me about the office. The texts were focusing on prophecy and prophesying and not discharging the office or executing or officiating the office and God was talking to me he could talk to me like that because of the career he asked me to leave and so there were books this thick books this thick it didn't matter and it was all about the gift most of you all right now you know that's true they don't talk to you about the office so they can't you can't say whether they they know what they're saying or not because the gift God will use the gift but he installs the office. So you can't be installed in the office unless he installs it in you first because the office comes from his realm. So I said, I'm, I'm fussing, God, I'm, I'm my God, I'm trying to find a book. He said, write one. How many of y'all have God do that to you? Set you up. I said, write what? He said, write a book on the, on the prophetic. Write a book on the prophetic? I said, I'm trying to tell you I'm looking for books on the prophetic. <laughs> Holy Ghost says, I'm telling you to write one. Because God knows what he put in you before your conscious mind knows. <laughs> so he knew. So I sit down, and, and first of all, I have this running joke with Jesus. I said, well, you know, Lord, I was lousy at writing proposals. He said, not toward the end. I said, you're right. He said, I want you to write this as if you were writing from a corporation. He said, I want you to write this as if you're writing from a entity who has millions and millions of locations and uh, agents and representatives. I said, okay. He said, so, and everywhere that it would line up, he would have me use a scripture term. So I wrote, Constructing the Contemporary Prophet, the hardest job I ever had. I had, we had 
computer problem, everything that can fight that, fought it. And then I couldn't get people, I asked a couple of people to help me edit it. And next thing I know, they're preaching it. That's why I don't trust folks today. People will say, I'll help you edit your book. No, you won't. You mean well, but you won't do well. So I don't. And I was one of those people, I was so happy when they came up with Grammarly and company. So I had to rewrite this book over and over again. And then we had three chapters that were probably one of the most powerful chapters. And the computer died and dumped the chapters. And back then, I didn't know about printing out no matter what. I can tell you, Windows 98 to today, because I have been beat up by all of them. But eventually, I wrote it. I wanted to get help, couldn't get help. So I, I didn't know what to do after I wrote it. A man walks in my office and tells me I'm from Kindle Hunt, and we help people get books out. 398 pages, eight and a half by 11 is the manual I wrote called Constructing the Contemporary Prophet. When you hear gift versus office, that's me. I introduced that in the book and I began to separate from that time onward the attributes of the gift versus the office. Not everybody is office material, although we like to put everybody there. But again, th th these people are doing this because God's kingdom, his realm, his offices, his entities are not real. They're not real to them. To them, they're, they're, they're like in somewhere, caught somewhere between the nursery school and the gym. Just playing. So I wrote this book and I got to tell you, I really wasn't, I was really ashamed of it because I knew it had errors and whatnot. And I wanted to fix them, but I couldn't find anybody to fix them. And then God, God told me, I want you to launch the book in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Because he had been sending me, uh, he, he started sending me to Tulsa. So he did. I'm in Tulsa and I'm trying to teach and I'm in these little cramped rooms and whatnot. And somebody says to me, you need to meet George Vanette because his wife is a prophet and this book deserves a bigger audience. So they gave me his number. I called him that day and he invited me to his house that day to bring my book. And she looked at it and she read it and she said, this is just superb. It's excellent. And got behind it. And they sold that book on, his, on her tables and everywhere else for a little bit. It was, it was the most expensive book they had. Kindle placed it at 50 bucks. That's what we did. And it was the most expensive book they had. But it walked you through the prophet from first voice to official service. The chapter 10, which, is, which Whitaker left out, chapter 10 is a whole chapter on the occult. Imagine if that hadn't been left out. So we are trying to pull, t pull chapter 10 together as a little bit of a pamphlet. Then we had the whole other chapter. I don't know. I think it was enough, yeah, in their in chapter. It goes back to the Mari prophets, M-A-M-I, the Mari prophets. And it lists the attributes of the occult and how they're different from God. So that chapter didn't make it in the handbook. Two things should have been there because if we had put that that section of the ham of the occult in the handbook, would these prophets have been had something to fight with when seduction came? And, and, and again, that's because we were operating back then, the entire body of Christ was operating back then on the gift. Because an officer has a higher duty, has a more defined purpose, and has some very distinct functions that preserve the institution. 
So we prepared the, the people, the operatives, so to speak, but we did not teach them how to keep what was being entrusted to them. So what do we have? We have all of this teaching. Because I put all of my occult background in it and all of the other stuff that I was doing and the things that I learned, I spent hours and, I mean, decades studying to become who I am today so that I no longer just guess at what's going on. And my senses have been upgraded to instincts because that's what an officer must do. Eventually, your senses must be upgraded to instincts, and those instincts must become reflexive. We heard a lot of that last night, did we not? Those officers, they had come, all of those faculties were groomed, trained, and upgraded to instincts, so that even though you did not know, they couldn't tell you articulately, unless they're prophets, what this person was doing, their instincts reacted to the spirit that was driving them. So fast forward, I did that and I traveled with them for a little bit, traveled with them, and, and Apostle Sally can tell you about it, traveled with them with the dictionary, did training, but it was ahead of its time simply because the people were steeped in gifting and predicting. Even now, a lot of you all come here, I'm like, I want to be like Dr. Price. First of all, you do not want to pay the price. I'm going to tell you right now, God was hard on me. He gave me his hard cases. And I had to do it, and we have many, many, many tests. But they all became the curricula that you get when you come here. So, when he, we, we rolled with that, and my acumen blew my mind. The other thing that helped me was when Shanae Tucker had Purity with Purpose, and she would graduate them, and there would be hundreds and hundreds of graduates, and we had to prophesy to them all. So you just wrote a book. You better have something to say. <laughs> and all the while, the enemy would tell me, these people don't want the prophetic to be academic. They don't want it to be practical. They don't want it to be technical. They want it to be experiential. But I, as I said, if I start something, I'm going to finish it. And I said... They may not want it now, and I don't know. Well, I did know a lot of the future. If you got my book, 1995 and Beyond, you know. But they're going to need it later. Because 1995 and Beyond predicted this day. So, as, as anybody who takes their office seriously, I wrote the book and then developed the solution, the curricula, the training courses, the assessment, because if you're, you, you know you're in the office when you can't stop at predicting and you must go to the project. The project is calling you. If, if you are right with just blah, 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 drop the mic, you drop nothing. Thank you for the PSA, because you're nothing more than a public service announcer. So once I did that, and, and I did constructing, God said, well, now, just to show you how God thinks, because a prophet has got to be a master, a specialist in how God thinks. Because thoughts become words, and words paint pictures, and pictures motivate actions. So he said to me, since you've written Constructing a Contemporary Prophet, Here's what you're going to do. I want you to write me a dictionary. It took me days to respond almost. I said, a dictionary? Why do prophets need dictionary? He said, because they don't know what they're talking about. Because to these prophets, God is not head of state. God is not 
top leader. God is not the Alpha and Omega. God is not the originator of all things. God is not the sovereign. Or, as a matter of fact, he's not even sovereign, let alone supreme. So these prophets are speaking out of their own heart. And if they had read Jeremiah, if they had read Ezekiel, if they had walked through Isaiah, if they had listened to Hosea, they would have found out you don't know God, you know nothing. The one chapter that God hammered into my head is Jeremiah 23. If you are going to be trained by God, Jeremiah 23 is going to wake you up in the morning because it tells you, it gives you God's thorough assessment of false prophets, self-promoted prophets. With that, he also hammered into my head Ezekiel 13 and Ezekiel 14. See, you want to measure prophets? Go to these, go to the author and creator of the prophets or the creator of the prophets and the author of their prophecies. So he said, write a dictionary. And I did. I wrote a nice little pamphlet. I was so proud of myself. I didn't know what to do. I almost died after writing the pamphlet. <laughs> and you know what he did? That man called my pamphlet a glossary. <laughs> glossary? I'm thinking, do you know the sweat, the pain, the tears I've had on glossary? So I went after it and I added a few more terms and it upgrade, he upgraded it to a booklet. <laughs> I love this man. So I'm, I, and I'm still sweating. I'm putting in hours, night after night. Now remember, I wrote this dictionary when there was no Google. I spent a fortune in research books. My daughter is here to tell you that my entire dining room was turned into books. And they would, I had a stack of books where I sat that was this high. And I had to keep moving them around and shuffling them around. I bought every dictionary I could find. I, through that process, learned a nice word called etymology. Yes. Etymology. And when you look it up, it's saying that it gives you the parts of a word that help you understand not only its origin, but why it originated. So I studied, again, I'm, she can tell you, they'd go to bed with me at the table, and I'd wake up, they'd wake up at the table. I would roll over and sleep on my couch because when God gives you a project, he takes you out of your life. Don't talk about, well, you know what? I don't know how to do, no, no. You're not doing God's project. You got a little task, you got a little assignment and do it with all your heart. But I want you to understand when you have a project, you cannot put it down because God can't. Now people think that because I say it was God and I, they think that he gave me a pass. God gave me a pass on nothing. If you have a project, he won't. So I wrote, the glossary, <laughs> upgraded to the booklet, and then I finally got to where he would call it a text. It still hadn't graduated to dictionary. As a matter of fact, he just kind of called it a vocabulary. I said, well, you know what, Jesus, you really, he said, because I want you to know what you're doing. See, God doesn't have you working in the blind as much people think he does. So I wrote it, retyped it. All along, they will tell you I don't have a typist. You all wonder what I do. I do not have a typist. I type all of my work myself. I write out of my head, out of my spirit, really. See, a lot of you didn't know that, did you? I don't have a staff on my book projects. I have a staff on the things that my books produce. <laughs> Y'all can hear the staff, right? So 
So I wrote it, and I remember when I first got the 500 terms, I was so thrilled I didn't know what to do. God said, I'm not done. I'm like, what else is there to say? <laughs> like, how many more terms do you need? But eventually, that thing cellulated in me. And all I could do is think another term. People would say words and he would mushroom the meaning. And they would use another term or I'd read scripture and he'd give me all of that. Or I would go through my research and read the books and he would answer. Now, this is important because I want you to understand that in the midst of this, he was fitting this language to the world to come because the previous world didn't have this, remember? A lot of the leaders, apostles and prophets that I came across supported me in constructing and in the dictionary. If it wasn't for Chuck Pierce, the dictionary I don't think would have ever gotten to the world. I thank him even today because he got it. If it wasn't for Bill Hammond doing the foreword, it would have never had the credibility it needed to, to travel. Now, remember, these people are back in something that's never been. So I finally got it up to 1,600 terms. Remember, I wrote it, I typed it, compiled it, etc. Got 1,600 terms. I was then a, by that time, my other book had given me credibility. So I was sitting at these tables, meeting these wonderful people. And... Um, <clears throat> I started producing. We thought we could produce the book. Amazon picked it up. And uh, we just, we were rolling. But we got to the point that it was so successful, we couldn't keep up with the demand. So we were stacking. You know, I had dozens and dozens of orders that we couldn't fill. Because how many of you know when you get ready to do something to break through, if you don't have a force? Remember we talking about the greater man? Whitaker House became the greater man, the stronger man. And if it wasn't for them, we would not have the dictionary today. It kept getting, we had people, it got burnt up. It got burnt up in a warehouse. It got drowned in the flood. Is this the truth or not? Say it again. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Uh, someone else's computer was helping me do it, got struck by lightning. I knew I had hit devils because that kind of on a book we're talking about a b-o-o-k book and the hotel yep the hotel caught on fire the entire swimming pool caught on fire burnt the lobby where I was getting the woman to help me sign off on doing it people have not often heard the story of the dictionary Talk about the most threatening book Satan's had ever seen. This all happened. As a matter of fact, the people who were the, the um, what do you call them? The, the product fulfillers, they, they just left business. So you would think that would tell me that I had something good going on, but it didn't. I read it wrongly because I didn't read it from God's perspective. The moment Whitaker picked it up, it's almost like all the devils walked away and said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love Whitaker House. I really do. And, and they have covered me in the prophetic and with my work in ways that I could never do myself. So we did the dictionary and it sold. I mean, people were like, whatever. And believe it or not, it sold more to the pagans than the saints. Because, see, the pagans know that their world is real because they're really in it. They're really ruling it. We don't believe our world is real. The dictionary has had, I can't even tell you how many lives. And then with my other broadcast, it's gotten a whole, another round of new life. From the dictionary, because, you know, God is like, oh, I got me something here. I'm going to get all I can get. I'm going to squeeze this here, turn up. So he turns around and he says, Mike, write a handbook. No, he didn't. He said, write a textbook on your dictionary. I just leaned on something. 
I can't even say it's the everlasting arms. I just, I just mean Jesus. But I, I tell you, whatever my vow to God is that whatever he asks me to do, I'm going to do it. Whatever he needs to get done, I'm going to fill his needs or I have no right to ask him to keep filling mine. So I started the handbook. And when I did, I just spent days and days in libraries trying to figure out how to do it, how to design it, how to lay it out. And then I took the dictionary terms, because if you have the dictionary, you know that the prophetic section is well over 100 terms. Just, I mean, you could take that section and just start a school. Just that. Matter of fact, many people did. And it's become required text. <clears throat> so I started the handbook. And I wrote the handbook the way I used to write job descriptions and position descriptions, functions, and operational protocols for my accounts. Which is why you can take that handbook and train prophets par excellence to do more than prophesy. I wrote it for prophets to think and not just speak. And so when you look at the handbook, I don't know how many of you have it, but if you don't have it, you need to get it. Every section ends with action because the prophetic is an action institution. It's an action slash actionizing institution, which means you put to use what you see, what you read. Scripture's all through it because I'm not doing this for Satan. I don't care about Zeus, Apollos. And all of those are in the dictionary, by the way. See, a lot of you probably never read it, so you didn't know that. You know there's a whole section on Islam? Buddhism? Because prophet's issue is other gods. Rivaling the creator God of gods. There's colors in there. There is dream interpretations in there. There are symbols in there because it's a prophet's dictionary. See that? See how it works? Prophet's dictionary. Nobody expects Webster not to have a word. You expect Webster, you, you go there and don't see a word in Webster, you get mad. So I have people mad with me. So it's been out 20 years, 25 years, including the glossary the vocabulary <laughs> and, the, and the booklet. <laughs> Matter of fact, a lot of those seasoned prophets back then have the, the uh, vocabulary. It's the green and yellow book. You can't, you can't pry that out of their hands. Now, I promise you, you can't. I asked somebody for one. No, I know you wrote it, but no. <laughs> no, I got to keep this. Uh-uh. That one, and as a matter of fact, some, which is another reason why I love Whitaker, so somebody took that one and just photocopied it and put their name on it. Oh, no, the dictionary has had to fight, and I've had to fight for my inheritance on it, my harvest on it. So now when people do that, Apostle Ashley just tells Whitaker House, we had a woman that just said, you don't have to pay for it, just click it. Because, you know, thievery, Satan can't stop you, then he's going to rob you. because he always wants to deprive, deprive you of God's harvest. So after the dictionary, after the handbook, I wrote assessing your prophetic self. So now from constructing a contemporary prophet, I have a full library of prophetic tools and resources, languaging and articulating everything that pertains to the prophet's office. Say it again. Oh, I forgot to end divine order. I wrote divine communications, which is your start book. It's your start book. It's the starter book, would you say? So it's, it's small compared to how I usually write. It's very conversationally written. And it's talking about, it compares prophecy as God's divine communications media with communications in general so that you understand that it's a communicating office. 
It's not just a function. Divine communications is kind of like our correspondence in the earth. So we have that. And then I have something to hopefully, if people want to do it right, called divine order. Now, divine order is just what it says, because God starts everything with a prophet. You cannot be a prophet and out of order. You can be prophetic. You can be a prophesier. But a prophet's job is divine order. A prophet's job is inst constitutional, institutional instruction. The constitution of the kingdom began with a prophet. So you know how you say, well, you know, but God, all I need to do is prophesy. No, no, God will never use you because he knows your secret life. And he knows that if he makes you public, your secret won't stay secret for too long. So in his protection, by protecting you, see, you know when God is ready to deal with you as a prophet because he makes you clean up. Clean up your room, clean up your house, clean up your credit, clean up your clothes, clean up your closet. Because if you don't know what divine order looks like in your house. And, and, and the, the, the more eminently he's about to use you, the more he makes mess irritate you. You could have been the sloppiest kid in the house. Then and now. But the first, he, God said to me one time, he said, so how you going to order my kingdom? You can't order your home. My closet, I just threw things in. He said, so how are you going to sort through my messes? I'm talking about me. Don't take it personal. He had me do laundry. He said, how are you going to clean the stench in my house when you're okay with that stench in that corner? Because God, if he can't build you as a prophet from the inside out, he cannot trust you as a prophet from the outside in. Oh, somebody going to hear me. If so if, if, here you go, and, and you'll be hypocritical. So you're going to give, God wants to talk to somebody about getting their house in order and yours isn't. So you're going to prophesy it to somebody else. And you can't even spell it in your own house. So you will, know, a lot of times, I don't know why God won't use you. God said, are you kidding? I can't use you because you're going to cost me too much loss. Because you're going to downgrade my word to your comfort zone. You're going to adapt my prophecy to your experience and your existence. I can't have that. So I'll just put you on the shelf. So can I go a little bit deeper? Yes. Yes. She said cut to the meat. I'm going to go to the marrow. This is a free prophetic class. If your, if your inherent and innate economy is based on you fulfilling a particular calling, if you do not meet the terms and conditions of that ca a calling, you are going to go broke and stay broke. So if God called you to be a messenger, and your whole life is a wreck, he will let you message, but you will not get a harvest. He will keep blowing on your harvest. He said, you'll put it in a bag with holes in it. He said, I blew on your blessings. I blew them away. Why? Because if God pays you for all of the things that you can't do, what incentive would you have to do it correctly? That's what's wrong with these kids today. They are rewarded for their trashiness, so they're pushing back on God's righteousness. So in order for him to correct it, he's got to bankrupt them. 
Otherwise, people won't know the truth from the lie, the truth from the false, the authentic from the fake. You don't know that. That's where everybody is today with the prophetic. God, now listen, the order piece doesn't start out. In the beginning, you start out with needing to know him and then needing to know his word and then understanding his truth and then familiarizing yourself with your predecessors. So as we go forward, are y'all okay with me with this? Because see, I'm not just talking to prophets. I'm talking to you all who have to be ministered to by them. You who encountered them and experienced them. And you're walking around. I don't know. Should I believe this word? I don't know. Should I not believe this word? It sounds almost like God, but it really feels wrong. See, I'm helping you vet your prophets and your prophecies. It's an interesting thing. If you accept people, prophets, words, um, at face value, God won't say anything. But if you ask God to keep you in the truth, he's going to have little trips and little chips of exposure happen. You'll happen upon something on Facebook. You'll stumble into somebody who's going to tell you their past or tell you their secrets. Because God said, I will not have you ignorant. And if I don't tell you where God's prophets hang out, then you're going to always be in devil's hideouts. Hiding from the righteousness of God, hiding from the truth of God, hiding. And what they do is they prevent, they don't just prevent your, your um, correction. They prevent the blessings that come with the correction because they prevent you from repenting. See, they inhibit your ability to repent. And so every repentance comes with a harvest because forgiveness brings a harvest. So as long as people remain penitent, impenitent, their harvest, the harvest that God has, gets hung up. So they may, you, I mean, you can talk, you know, lay claim to monetary uh, benefits, but the truth is when the Lord makes you rich, he adds no sorrow. So you will get that sorrowful harvest. Every time you turn around, this is happening and that's happening and this is taking your money and that one is costing you. And I don't care how wealthy you are, you're going to be that even all the way up to always being tied up in lawsuits. Does this speak to you all? Yeah. So when, when, when you think about how I got here, I had to live, I, I went through it all. I remember my car being so nasty I wouldn't clean it. God said, but if you don't clean your car, how are you going to clean my vessels? So, uh, Lewis, you're going to have a lot of work, baby. My brother got an amazing job as a detailer. Now, I don't know if he can or if he can't, but if he does, y'all going to pay him. Cause, mm -mm. So he said to me, he said, but your car is filthy. And I'd get in there. See, God and I started out meeting in my car. That was the sanctuary. He was like, but this is a funky sanctuary. I don't want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Baby, I had weeks of bags of cartons of McDonald's and carrying on eating on the run so you ready for what he did he got my car stolen because to whom much is given much is required and to whom they commit the most they demand the most he got my car stolen Yes, he did. Told me he did, because I fussed with him. <laughs> you know, prophets, prophets, pro you know, being in the office puts you in a place where you talk to God as your boss, straight up. So I fussed with him. I said, why you let that devil take my car? I said, because I know you were there. And I know you could have stopped it. And I want to know why you didn't stop it. And I went into the good as I've been to you spill. He was so unimpressed. He said, why didn't you clean it? You didn't keep it up, so it didn't seem like it mattered. I was 
so hurt with God, I, I wouldn't even talk to him. I was mad. Got my car stolen. I think my car might have been gone two weeks. Now, you would think that it was chopped up. No, mm -mm, they ran out of gas, beat it up, put it on the side of the road, and just left it there. Popped out the ignition, broke the windows, and left it. I looked at my car, I said, look what you did. He said, next time you'll take care of your business. I wouldn't get the tags on it. I wouldn't update the license. I wouldn't do anything. He said, so it obviously didn't mean anything to you. So why should I guard it? I was like, hmm. So I got my car back. And, and, and I remember he said, you know, when you are rolling with God at that level, he is blunt. God's blunt anyway, but he, but he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't blind our eyes and ears to hear it. So I'm rolling with him. He said, okay, so you're going to get your car back. I said, like, I don't want it. Well, it's your car. Because <laughs> when your car or something like that is thrown, you feel utterly violated and vulnerable. And that's when you realize how much God is keeping. See, y'all hearing what I'm saying? So if you're called to high, if you're called to high, and the prophet is the first office of creation. The prophet is the first ministerial office of creation. So you think he's going to let you do things messy? It didn't matter. Pay your bills. Handle God's business. I can tell you over and over again things like that that he did. And he ended up, he gave me a name for it. He calls them object lessons. I'm thinking he was real objective. And so whenever crazy happens, I don't treat it as if Satan has more power than God. I go to God and say, now, Lord, and I start running down the word and then I start running down our experiences, our relationship, and go on. And eventually he'll say, yeah, well, blah, blah, blah. That's it. And you fix it, and everything just kicks right on board. Psh, like it never stopped. You think about David and the Gibeonites. When God dries up your blessings, you have to find out where you are that is causing him to vindicate his righteousness through your trial. You have to ask, <laughs> what did he say? David, Lord, there's famine in the land. David is like, wait a minute, we your people. We the only, we the only nation you got on earth right now. So why are we hungry? <laughs> why are the heavens closed over us? Wait a minute, hold on. He had sense enough. If you're going to be a top leader, you're going to have to recognize no leader is in position without a deity. Not one. I don't care what they tell you. The atheist has a deity called myself. Because everything about earth began spiritual, invisible. And so David said, Lord, there's famine in the land. God's like, so he has to search. Your money funny? Find out. Instead of fussing him out, griping, find out. You can't raise money for your car and all of that. Find out because when God, one thing about God, you do not want him on the witness stand of your life. Because the Holy Ghost is going to bear witness against you. He's going to testify against you. And you know why? Because his righteousness is important and he cannot let you rise on your sin because you will pervert his people. So he has to defend his future by trying your behind. We've been on this journey. Y'all all right? She thought we messed up. 
So, so how does that look? We can start as something as basic as paying your tithes. God's like, why am I going to increase your income? It's not going to increase mine. But God, I can't pay my, my tithes because I got bills. He said, I'm the first bill you get on your paycheck. How come I got to wait? And then he says, he'll tell you, but you're not serving. I told you to go to the church this many days to put in this many hours to do this thing when you got there and you don't. So why should I stretch for you? You're not stretching for me. He'll deal with you in your home. You're a mean person in your house. So why would I want to expose you to the world? If, if your home is too much pressure for you to be kind, how much more the world? You look ugly with your spouse. My bride is my, my church is my wife. I don't need you beating on my wife and abusing my wife. Then we can bring it closer to home. I gave you five money-making ideas. What you do with them? You want that thin air money. I don't have a thin air bank. What you sow, you must reap. That's on all sides. Is this talking to you? Because some of you all, y'all got money-making ideas caught in the vault of your fear. I need you to go to your fear boat. Y'all all right? Elder, you all right? You all right, up? He said, I'm working on it. You all right, up? He said, I'm there. I got it. See, when God starts opening his book and witnessing you, well, Lord, I don't understand why I can't accumulate money. You can't accumulate money because you can't keep a job. You want that thin air money bank. I don't have that. Some of you all, he told you to go out and witness and go share. And instead of sharing, you went out and started fussing. Some of you, your money is tied up in your mouth because you have summoned spirit of poverty by your lips, by your judgments. Your criticisms. You understand if you if you fall into judgment and criticism, do you understand that God's got to judge you and that judgment cannot be effective if he does not interrupt your blessings? How else are you going to know you messed up? If life is still good, you don't know. What did he say? He said you could tear your own house down with your mouth, continual dripping. And some of y'all are just mean to the saints. Just mean. You're just mean people. You only do what you have to do. You have no heart for God's people. You have no passion, no compassion. Forget passion. You don't even have compassion. Everything you do for God, you do grudgingly. It's a duty. It's a hardship. It's an inconvenience. And God says, so is your prayer. I pay attention to how y'all feel. People come into church. You are, I mean, I want you to know the last three months y'all been kicking up. So I want you to understand I'm just giving you symptoms because you all have been doing very well. You have been trying. We're about to get a whole bunch of people. They will be different. I need you to fire your mean devil. I need you to crush your ethnic arrogance. Because you can have 10 things on your plate, on your list that God wants to deal with. But if you can tap into the one that's most important to him, he will wait and indulge you for all of the others. That's what, And you can see that in the tithe. He said, bring my tithes and see if. He didn't say get your morality right. He didn't say any of those things. He said, just, just see to it that my house doesn't collapse 
and lack. That's what he says. He said, because when my priests cry of money problems, I've got to judge the people who are causing it. So why are we here? Because we are the embassy, home of the congregation of the what? Money. Of the what? Money. Do you all understand what that means? Not the whiny. I need you to not be the congregation of the mighty, of the whiny. I need you to be mighty in God for the pulling down of stronghold. Lack is a stronghold. Rejection is a stronghold. Gossip is a stronghold. So you need to understand the strongholds you are supposed to be pulling down and not signing up with the lifetime membership. This word, God may forgive a whole lot of other churches because they don't have the level of truth and the level and dimension of wisdom that you have. So he's not going to let you treat his wisdom any old kind of way. He expects a harvest on his wisdom. Because wisdom is a defense. Wisdom answers all things. You understand wisdom breeds plenty. Wisdom breeds authority. And your life should be superb by now. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. You're not broke because of what's in your bank account. You're broke because of what's in your heart. You have too much, your heart's full of too much impoverty or too much impoverished um, thoughts and ideas for the wealth to come in. You need to do a trade out. I need to trade some things out. I need to swap a few things. You need to give up your hate for love. You need to give up your anger for peace. Because those are the things that heaven blesses. So you don't have his currency in your soul. <laughs> you understand. We have locked Galatians 5.22 into morality. Y'all didn't hear me. But Galatians 5.22 is the kingdom's currency. It is what Satan or Lucifer breached to inject poverty and lack in God's realm. It's a trading, those are trading tools. I'm, come, I'm wrapping it up. I'm almost there. But those are trading tools. You understand? So you trade peace for chaos. Both of them are beings. Jesus is the prince of peace. And chaos is the spirit of everything. Destruction. You have to trade your sorrow for joy. It's a currency. People will bless folks of joy and they will flee people who are always sad. You may not have the currency of paper money, but folk will do for you because you make them feel good. They'll cover you because you're always there for them. They will bring you a little something, something. If you come on, if you're on a ministry team, you're on our leadership team, and none of the sheep feel inclined to bless you, it's because your currency is off. Because the harvest of ministry is material for spiritual. Oh, y'all didn't hear me either. So you all, you know, you have Sundays over, you flowing out, you don't try to find out how people's lives are going, who's doing this or that. But I'm going to tell you something. Paul said when we sow the right thing spiritually, then we sh you should reciprocate with the equivalent of material. Y'all didn't catch that. See, when... Um, Do 
Do you understand why America's broke? Because they bought into Satan's selfishness and his selfish principles. His currency is based on hostility. So he has to use bully tactics because he doesn't have any fruit of the spirit to trade. He, so he changed God's benevolence to his malevolence. So he now makes you obey him by bribing you or bullying you. That's his B to B prosperity. Selflessness has got to replace selfishness because it's a currency. There's a reason why they call money and wealth and all of that a current because it's, they're traitors. When you get hot with somebody and you want to move into an anger and lock into grudge, guess what? You have your personal emotional satisfaction of that, but you, do, you shut down. Your economy, your soul has its own economy. And I'll close on this statement. How many of us know someone who's starting a business or trying to do something and when they tell you it falls on deaf ears, dying, dying, you can almost read that they're not going to purchase anything from you or serve you or take you seriously. Why? Because you shut down your currency. Because people can feel when you care. They can feel it. People can fear, feel when you forgive. And forgiveness is, the, is like the highway. It's the highway to your restoration and your economy. Some of you all, you got too many grudges. You're holding too many things against people. You're binding up your own things. So you're emitting unforgiveness through your complaint through your rehashing through your criticism through your judgments you are doing that and God is like yeah but I'm not gonna pay you for that there's no paycheck on that not from my realm and he'll give you just what you need you fall under what I often like to call his custodial care not his kingdom release You got issues with people, get on the phone and kill it. Yeah. Kill it, be done with it. If, it doesn't matter if they accept it. The issue is God must accept it because he's the one that loosens the heart. You do not want people sending up to heaven bad things on your name all the time. Oh, here comes so-and-so trouble. Here comes trouble. People want to feel good about you coming. They want to say, ooh, I'm, I'm, I'm there. You know, one of the things that we get, we have some sheep in here that that's what it's like all the time. I don't care where we go, and I, we don't know how it's happening, but I don't know, care where we go. Ashley is the one that everybody wants to see coming. You're always so happy. I'm like, yeah, she is. I had to talk to her about that. <laughs> She just starts smiling. Ashley can say the hardest things to people. <laughs> and they still want to buy a lunch. You say, good morning, how you doing? And they met with you for 10 months. Well, it just didn't, didn't have the right spirit. We go, I don't care where we go, in the country, in the world. You all were amazing this weekend, and they kept talking about how wonderful the team is. Over and over again. Why? Because we're an embassy. People don't expect to be beaten up here. We are peacemakers. We are reconcilers and conciliators. We're there for God's business and purposes. So you all are not going to walk past people and not say hello. How many of you all came from them churches? Yeah. And she said, act like you're not there. <laughs> that is not the congregation of the mighty. We are an embassy. 
I am a goodwill ambassador with papers. Y'all are not going to bind up our blessings because you're comfortable with binding up yours. Give God a praise. All right, come on, let's clap through the tears. Let's clap through the tears. Might have a hobbling applause, bless God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, she's still talking. So dinner, I need all of y'all to sew into my dinner. Everybody, you, wherever the basket is, just put it up here after it's over because God wants to lose you. Some of you all, y'all just need to sow a little something for the miracle that's coming next week. Because next week is going to be the beginning of our miracle season. That is a promise by the Holy Ghost. Mm. You can have it. Well, now I don't have to say that we're going to take another offering. Okay. I didn't know you would. But well, that's all right. But you do be an apostle and you always track, track it with me. Like Jesus, that. that's where I want to be. Right there. <laughs> Last night, I'm bring it. okay. Last night, I was standing in this door over here, and one of the gentlemen who was with Apostle Hatcher's somebody, something, or with the sheriffs, I wasn't really sure kind of who was with whom at one point. But he, he stood back there and he said, This was toward the end of the night, and he said, This is a ministry of such excellence. He said, I have not seen this level of excess. Now, this wasn't even our event. That's what was funny is, although it kind of was, it kind of was, uh, <laughs> kind of was. There was plenty of us showing up in it. And that was probably the most resounding comment was the staff, the team, the cafe staff. They got great tips yesterday. Yeah. I said, uh, between the two events, I said to Marsha, I said, is that the tip jar? She said, yeah. I mean, I think I saw a 10 in there. I saw 20. I mean, just she was counting. And I said, make sure that, you know, y'all get the tips. This your tip. Here's your tip. And uh, just, just excellent, excellent service. So to anybody who contributed to the success of yesterday, whether before yesterday, even if you couldn't be here, we thank you. To in all the meetings, uh, even Dave, you know, Dave, we thank you for the sound. You weren't here yesterday, but Senator Jett, he was like, The sound in here is sweet. The system, I said, We have a pro in the church now, we have a profession now. He said, I can tell. <laughs> we, got, we got help coming for you, so you're gonna love this. Well, help is on the way, yes, it is. Somebody, <laughs> go ahead, Chief. Get it, Chief. Get it, mother. Get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. I told you when we said that breakthrough is is here. That that was not a prophetic statement. That's a factual one. And to those who have been in the meetings, you know it's real. And to those who haven't, you know it's true anyway. Why well, say it if it's not true? So exciting at what God is breaking loose and pulling together. So if you have your seed, uh, you can also, you see the electronic way to give is on the screen. If you want to bring something down, you can do that as well. Um, for constructing a contemporary profit, there is a, going back around to it, there is a teaching up on Dr. Price's Paula Price powertrain which you can get to from her homepage at the top. Just click the tab, you'll be redirected. And you can enroll, it's, it's two-part video teaching on constructing the contemporary prophet. If you are in the office, being trained in the office, if you're watching online, being trained to be in any of these offices, you wanna get your hands on as much information as possible. I think the easiest way to get lax and complacent is when you're a member of a church like this, and it's so easily within reach that you're actually not doing everything. Think about if you moved here, what you were doing to get everything you could before you got here versus what you're doing now. That'll let you know if you've fallen back into a cozy, comfortable complacency or if you're still very driven to, to get what God has for you. Information, information, what is it? Information is the new currency. Mm -hmm. The more you know, it's not only the more you grow, 
but the more you know, the wealthier you become. Yes. So you need to leverage your future with getting as much information on this subject or any subject as you can. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm going to go watch this service again in my room by myself with a box of Kleenex and some anointing oil and communion <laughs> and everything else <laughs> to get myself right with God in every other way possible, straighten myself out and be fit for the master's use. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That it may be in that order, maybe not. I'm thinking a lot of tears will be happening first, possibly. And then, I mean, seriously, Friday, I was in my bathroom under my, you know, the counters under the sink where nobody goes but me, cleaning stuff out. God was like, You haven't looked under here. Not really. You know how you just add to, but you don't. Yeah. Yes. And I opened the door one day and I don't know, something fell out. And I said, this is a problem that I can't fix right now, but I will soon. Yes. Jill and Deborah yes. do that. They have a business to do that. So stand up, stand up, because they came to my house and did it. They You've been will vetted. help you organize, throw away, whatever. Um, uh, put their contact number up there or something, but you you need to know that if it's not your forte, that doesn't make you a mess. It just need, means you need another strategy. Amen? Hey. So these two ladies do that. God bless. We're advocates of paying people. Pay somebody. Yeah. Yes, they do. Indoor and outdoor cleaning. Yeah, they did it was amazing. Did. They did. It's fantastic. And something else, right? Call it something? Oh, mm -hmm. They got the car detailing? Well, y'all need to no, talk Lewis. to Lou. Wave, Lewis. Hey. Please, he'll say, hey. That's like, hey. He's <laughs> a car detailer. Any other <laughs> services in the house that we can pay you for cleaning? Oh, yeah, you clean, too. Tania cleans as well. Yes. So y'all understand, Dr. Price, if you all are going to do it, you need to form an organization and a conglomerate and work together to do it because I am not having silly rivalry and stupid competition in my church. So if you can't do it as a team, I'm taking you off the list. Are we all clear? We're clear. Again. I'm going to tell you, so there's no, we're not going to have that kind of competitiveness. We are the commonwealth of the kingdom. So everybody's going to have all things in common. So uh, y'all need to meet and uh, don't worry about it. We got some people that will help you chief is the best one between her and prophet Angela. We can help y'all fortify this, but that other stuff is not going to be in my church. So if you got, if you have relational issues, you have get along problems, then you don't do it in my church. And y'all understand. Yes. All right. And, and we uh, strongly encourage you to check with us first as leaders, Before call the office to get a reference for anybody who says that they do something, especially if it involves bringing them into your home or your personal business, which is pretty much all this car, house, finance, whatever. I mean, there's obviously, you know, you have your professions and what you do, but these things, like she said, can blow up on a church because it was somebody I met in your church who did or did not fulfill honor, honor services and things like that we have the ebb i was going to say we'll bring say that it. Tell them to we'll bring up. that commercial back uh, so they oh, there you are Shade, come on now and alvin there you are come on down come on make haste or maybe you can't walk carefully <laughs> <laughs> Well, to um, the entrepreneurs, we encourage you to join the Embassy Business Bureau. The website is um, embassybb.org. You can join. The application fee is $25. And what we are is we are a, a committee of entrepreneurs where you leave reviews. It's similar to the actual BBB, but it's for the kingdom. And so you can go ahead and you can join. We are taking applications and we do vet you. We make sure that you're legal. Go. We check Google reviews. We check your Facebook reports. We make sure that you are who you say that you are. And then everyone that goes through the process and passes, we put you on our website as a certified member. And also it lets the public know that they can trust doing business with you. 
I just want to add a little tidbit to the end. So if you do a bad job, we're going to put it on our site. We're going to let people know. So we're going to give you a chance to fix whatever you did wrong because we do air once in a while, but it's how you fix your error that we're going to um, let everybody know. So if it's not something that it's business savvy and it makes this church look bad, you won't be on the business site. I think that's a good idea and you'd like to be a part of it. Hold your hand up. All right. If you have a business idea and they don't just start with that, we also help you nurture your business. Yeah. So we help you find the fine tune, the things you need to fine tune. Now you might think, well, I don't know, but my name travels. So if you want to get that openness, that access, that's something to do it. Now, one of the reasons why you didn't raise your hand is because you think of yourself as not vetable. We help you get there, okay? Because we all got to start somewhere. Thank you. Embassybb.org. I like that. <laughs> yes, has a nice ring to it. Okay, did we all give? Did we all sow? Anybody need to put some? Oh, you know why? Because the basket is down here. We brought it down front. <laughs> put a prayer on it. Put it on the altar. It's some electronic warfare. Some technical warfare. Let's just say it like that, warfare. August. Oh, okay. In August, B2B is returning. Back to the basics, third Friday. We'll be back. Adults in the chapel, youth in 205. I'm not sure what our subject will be this month. Usually, sometimes I let you guys pick. Usually, sometimes. Which one is it, right? Usually or sometimes. Let them pick what the subject is, digging deep into these subject matters, working this. Ooh, let's, now, now you see why next week we're going to start with deliverance prayer after church. Hallelujah. Ooh, somebody's alarm is going off. <laughs> Time to wake up. Wake up. Get up. All right. I'm going to pray. Oh, come on, football. Run. Why is it that teenage athletes are the slowest walkers? Come on, man. <laughs> Turn Dr. Price back on. Up. Oh. Uniqua. Be weary and well doing. Continue to press on. That he has a great path for you to follow, and you're going to shortly know what that is. All that confusion fog is going to leave, and you're going to know exactly what it is that you're going to do. You have grown leaps and bounds. He said, but all of that was getting you ready to groom, to grow and groom you. Because your calling is so great, God is almost like me. He's not playing with you. And you're going to really feel that by the time we get into the middle of 2023. So you understand he's not picking on you. He's grooming you. Okay. Amen. Amen. Yeah, y'all can snatch that. <laughs> y'all go ahead and snatch it. Just snatch it. <laughs> don't, don't forget that part where she said God's not playing with you. All right. Don't forget that part. We catch the end. They live happily ever after part. Yes. <laughs> and we skip everything else. Let us pray so we can get out of here. Father, Lord, we thank you for the word of truth in this house. We bless our apostle, we bless our chief apostle, we bless this seed and everything that it represents. We summon in prosperity into this house that not just financial prosperity, but soul prosperity, physical prosperity, and our health prosperity, that we will have prosperity flowing wall to wall, wealth, visible, invisible, 
assets and everything else under the sun we decree that this house will be a house of abundance that our chief apostle will move in affluence and that the last thing that she ever has to worry about is how something will be accomplished the only thing will be when we will get it done and so we thank you for it lord and thank you for this correction we thank you for your truth going in and realigning us setting us up sanctify us by your truth your word is truth yes. and this true worth god word today let it sanctify our spirits let it scrub our souls let it even heal our memories and be able to move forward in who you have called us to be collectively as a house and individually in your kingdom in jesus name amen amen and we have pizza and salad in the cafe for sale so you can fellowship and munch